You know, you can tell how old you are by how people read the announcements, okay? Old people like me use these old three-ring binders, right? If they're a little younger, they have their laptop. If they're really young like Arturo, they can actually read their iPhone. You ever notice that? They can do their announcements. I feel so old now. Good morning. I don't know if you've noticed, but I got a little red heart on my lapel here. That's what that was given to me this morning. I don't know if you know, but I go out during the worship for a little bit to pray with our children in different classrooms every Sunday because I felt like God gave me a word that there were some great leaders in our children, with our children, and to pray blessings over them and protection and to begin to now impart God's blessing upon them. And one of the little girls in kindergarten said, I love you, Pastorini, and she gave me a little red heart. So I'm going to keep that right there. Made me an emotional mess before I had to preach. It's like, oh, thank you. I love you too. You know, I was uh, last week. I was gone, and I was uh, down in uh, Southern California at my niece's wedding, and uh, it was a be- beautiful wedding. And then I took uh, my wife and I took our grandkids to Disneyland for a couple days, the happiest place on earth. <laughs> so they tell me. I just want to nap when I think of Disneyland. But we went, uh, we actually went to, because of my, my grandkids or my daughter's kids, who's going to be here this Friday, Danielle, uh, she tells stories about me. They're not true unless they're good, by the way. And, uh, but she homeschools her kids, and so we went to the Lincoln, the little Lincoln exhibition where the animatronic Lincoln talks. Pretty incredible. I totally renovated it. But I loved it because it had a lot to do with today's message as we go on the, the series of Tough Hide and Tender Heart. And it made me think so much of how he's a great example of what I want to talk about today because Abraham Lincoln, if you remember, when he was elected president in 1861, he was elected by the least, the smallest percentage of any president ever. Only 39% of the people voted for him. And the people, just two-thirds of the nation didn't even like him. And so when he came to his inauguration, he actually arrived in Washington at night in disguise because of fear of assassination. That's how he began his presidency. And then right away, obviously, we went into civil war in the north against the south, and he was embroiled in a four-year battle with a nation that was about to tear itself apart. Welcome to being president of the United States. And in that process, it is, it is written that there, there has been so, they, they think he was the most insulted and slandered president ever in the history of the nation. He was hated on both sides. And when he dared to bring to the, to the finally bring the Emancipation Proclamation to the floor and get it passed, that he was surprised, he knew the South would hate him for abolishing, abolishing slavery in the South, but he didn't expect that the North would also write horrible things about him. It was written in many northern newspapers that the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was the death knell to the nation. And he was so assaulted by his friends, he was so insulted by so many on such a barrage that he told his wife, I don't know if I can continue to be president if even my friends continue to insult me. Yet it wasn't until he, he won the, the Civil War, the victory of the Civil War, he was reelected, and five days later, he was assassinated. And he never got to enjoy the fruits of what he later be, became called the Great Emancipator. And by doing so, brought to fruition the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, which abolished slavery, and I think saved our nation from damnation. Because the Bible is very clear. When someone builds a nation upon others losing their freedoms, God destroys that nation. And so he saved the nation, yet the, even the, the Sunday after he was, he was assassinated, the, the pastors all over the nation wrote new sermons about how he was like the modern-day Moses who led people out of Egypt but never got to see the the promised land. And so today we're going to talk about insults, insults without injury. That's the name of our message today, insults without without injury, because there is a way to live a life where you can live above all of that. And I just love some of the quotes from Abraham Lincoln because it was his faith in God that sustained him through all of the insults and all the slanders and all many people who, who hated him. When it comes to his faith, he said, 
in the midst of the Civil War, I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth and be an atheist. But I cannot conceive how a man could look up into the heavens and say, there is no God. And when his own general, who called him, by the way, the original gorilla, a man that was weak and a man that couldn't make decisions and a man that could never get to the point, his own general made fun of him. And his general said to him one day, how can you be so sure that God is on our side? And he said to his general, I'm not concerned that God is on our side. I'm concerned we're on God's side. And so he understood his place with God. And when they made fun of his look, because he was a tall, gangly guy, and they constantly made fun of his face and of his looks. And he said, in response to one reporter who was basically saying he was ugly, he said, common-looking people are the best in the world. That is the reason the Lord made so many of them. <laughs> that, was, that was a nice response. And he said, when the North attacked him for the Emancipation Proclamation, he said, in response to them, saying that it was the death knell of the nation if we ended slavery, he said, whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on them personally. He was very aggressive with what he believed. And then he finally said, those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. Now that is just a man, and he's definitely a man who had plenty of foibles and plenty of issues. He was just an everyday man, insulted and slandered. But even someone who had no sin, the, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who did not sin, was still insulted and slandered. And Jesus, who was the walking personification of truth, as he tried to express truth to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and leaders of the days, they said horrible things about him. Several one was when he was accusing the Pharisees of being the, their father being the devil. They said to Jesus, at least we know who our father is. You're an illegitimate child. And so they're basically impugning his mother, Mary, the Virgin Mary, of have, having, having sex with a Roman guard as opposed to him being the son of God. They were impugning him, slandering his mother, slandering him, insulting him. When he went to reach the lost and the broken, he would go to where they were. They had parties. They had food. They had drink. He would just go to where they were to reach them. And so they accused him, insulted him, and, and said that he was a drunkard and a glutton. He was just going where the broken people were. When he healed people, they said, you are healing by the power of Satan. And then they said, you're not only are you healing, you are filled with a demon. They said that to Jesus, you are demon-possessed. Now remember, this is not just an ordinary man. This is God in the flesh. And God in the flesh is getting insulted and impugned and slandered. And all he's doing is bringing truth. He's bringing truth. A thing about insults, the word insult is the Latin word insultare, is two words. In, which means on, and saltare, which means to trample or to jump. It literally means to find someone's weakness, someone's pain, and jump on it. It's the intent to hurt someone. That's what an insult is. They're looking for a pain point. But the problem was with Jesus, he had no sin. And, and there's different levels, by the way, of, of attacking people. First of all, there's a level we try to stay at, which is the intellectual, factual level, right? Where if you have a, 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 a thought and I have a thought, and we have different thoughts and different ideas. We try to use conversation and bring facts to the table to say, here's my facts on the issue. And you say, well, here's my facts on the issue. And you try to resolve it intellectually, right? Just an intellectual conversation. But if that doesn't work, you go to the next level, which is emotional. Now, the emotions get involved. And we try to use our emotions to convince you. And you try to use your emotions to convince me. And if the emotion doesn't work, then you go to the personal attack peace, which is insults and slander. And that's what we see happening all around our nation today, is people that can't communicate on an intellectual level have gone past the emotional level. Now they're in the insult and slander. And the only thing left after that is personal violence. And that's how they finally thought they would stop Jesus, to hang him on a cross, to kill him. 
So it starts at the intellectual side, goes to the emotional side, goes to the personal attack, and then the only place left is violence. And so we have been given a script, some scriptures in 1 Peter chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. And this portion of scripture is designed for us as Christians. We cannot expect the world to live like Christ until they know him. We, as Christians, are supposed to live by Christ. So this chapter 3 of 1 Peter is going to give us some instruction as to how to overcome insults without injury. Let me begin in verse 8. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. So what does that mean? What does that, what does even that mean that God is giving us a blessing? The Greek word for blessing is makaroi, which means to be fully satisfied in God. Fully satisfied in God. It is not like a, the gift. You know, if you, we think of a blessing as having a great family or having enough money to pay our bills or having a healthy life. and We think of it as gifts. But the blessing that he's talking about that we would receive if we choose not to repay evil for evil is a supernatural satisfaction that supersedes any conditions around you. It supersedes your personal health. It supersedes your finances. It su supersedes any circumstance at all. It is a supernatural satisfaction of you knowing God is drawn near to you and you are drawn near to God and you sense the presence of Jesus all around you all the time. That is the blessing that is promised to the Christian. If we could learn the discipline of repaying an insult with a blessing. Now, what's challenging about this scripture, and it's challenging for all of us, which is why discipleship is a lifetime process, is it, do, it doesn't say here, if someone insults you, repay them with a blessing. But after a couple times, forget it. Go after them on social media. Totally rip them up. Shred them. Destroy them. Give them a couple shots, and then you're off the hook. It doesn't give us that out. There's no asterisk at the bottom. Some conditions apply. It says, as God tends to do, because he is the ultimate truth, when someone slanders you, insults you, curses you, you repay them with a blessing. And if you choose to be that kind of a Christian, then I will give you this supernatural, divine blessing, and you will feel my presence. I will draw you near to me. You will be drawn close to Jesus. You will sense our presence, and you will know I am blessing you. That is a powerful gift that God has promised us. If we would choose to not repay evil for evil, but evil for a blessing. And the first point of that, of that my feel, by the way, I know I miss my, my point fill in sometimes because I get so excited about preaching. That's why we have an app you can download and you can fill in the blanks. And so if I miss one, don't, don't stress. If you download the app, then you can fill in the blanks on that thing. It's, they're all there for you. So in case I get too excited and forget one, you'll get it. But the first lesson, life lesson of this is insults die from lack of participation. Insults die from lack of participation. You don't have to be baited into an argument. I mean, they can bait you. Don't nibble at it and don't bite at it. So they die from lack of participation. It takes two to fight. If one person's fighting, then people know who the, the person that's the aggressor is. It's not you. So insults die from lack of participation. But you go get, get you, you, you nibble on that thing, you grab that hook, they're going to reel you in. And you're going to play their game for a long time. And before you know it, you just kept going. You go lower and lower and lower on the, on the totem pole. So insults die from a lack of participation. Then we go on in verse 10. 
For whoever would love life. How many of you want to love life? Anybody here want to love life? Good. Half of you, that's great. Yeah. Uh, how, many, how many of you want to see good days? How, how many want to see? Yeah. Okay, I'm another half of you. That's good. How many of you just hate raising your hand on Sundays? You hate when I ask you to raise your hands. Okay, there you are. I knew you were there somewhere. Okay. That's, that's what happens. I'm not raising my hand. Who do you think you are? All right. I did it when I said yes to Jesus. I'm not doing it again. I get it. I get it. I understand. But he begins by saying, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongues from evil. He's talking to Christians. This is for Christians. This is for us. If you want to love your life and see good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I want you to picture this. You ever been someplace talking to someone, and you could tell they were totally engaged in what you were saying? They were listening to you. The scripture saying is, when you choose to be a person of peace, when you choose to respond, not in anger, but in peace, God is attentively watching you. He's watching you. He's listening to your words so that you may be blessed with a good life and be blessed with good days. And so that when you pray, he is attentively listening to your petitions to answer your prayers. But if you get baited into insults and slander and deceit, it literally said God's face turns away. He cannot hear your prayers. It is a warning to Christians that we must understand that God is carefully watching us are we ambassadors of his son, Jesus? Do we seek peace and pursue it? There's a difference between just seeking it and pursue it. Pursue it is you're putting your actions into speaking and acting in ways that bring peace, not animosity. You are not casting lines of insults and slanders and deceit and evil but you are speaking words that are gracious and kind. And if you do so, you will love your life. You will see good days, and God will hear and answer your prayers. It's a powerful statement. Sometimes, you know, we've all heard that we go through hard times and we think God's punishing us, you know, some, and God's not punishing us. He's preparing us. Sometimes you go through hard times because he's preparing you for something great and he needs you to be ready to call upon him. And so God is saying in this whole series for Christians is, listen, the world doesn't get what you have. They're going to insult you for what you have. They insulted Jesus and he was dying for them while Jesus was on the cross dying his life flowing out of him. He was dying for the very people that were still insulting him from the ground. He's sinless, giving his life for all humanity, those who will call upon him. And the very people he was dying for looked and said, Ha! Heal yourself, physician! Ha! What kind of king are you? <laughs> Son of God. Insulting him as he's dying for them. And if we are ambassadors of Jesus, is it too much for us to seek peace and to pursue it? If our Savior died for us and all humanity? The lesson is that God rewards honorable responses. God rewards, honorable responses. We are to be people that have honor. We preserve our honor and our integrity through Christ.
Move on to verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asked you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. In order to do this, we're going to have to learn this next life lesson, which is when insults happen, respond, don't react. Respond, don't react. We all know the difference between responding and reacting. Responding is careful. It's thoughtful. I'm going to respond to that question. Think about how I answer it. Reacting is you just let your emotions, your anxiety, your anger take over, and you react to it. We're told to respond to it with gentleness and respect. But how are you going to respond if you can't, don't know how to? How many of us, I'm, no, no, no raising hands, I'm not going to put you, don't worry about it. But if I were to say to you, come up here right now and give us a three minute, your three-minute testimony about why you need Jesus. Right now, three minutes, you got three minutes, tell us why we should follow Jesus. I wonder how many of us are prepared to do that. That scripture says, you need to be ready right now, in a moment's notice, to give your testimony to someone about why you're following Jesus. Can you do it right now? If you come upon a car accident and you want to pray with someone, or you're in an airplane, or standing in line somewhere, do it at the DMV. People really need Jesus at the DMV, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> My goodness. The last time I almost got in a fist fight, it was at a line in the DMV. By the way, pray for them. <laughs> and by the way, they got back at me. I just got my new license. I'm telling you, I look like one of the hitmen from Sopranos. No, no joke. It is that bad. I totally look like a hitman from the Sopranos. It scares even me, and it's my picture. But we're told to be able to give an account for what we believe. Can we do that? Can we, without massive emotion and insulting anybody, can we just tell people why we believe that Jesus came and died for us? Why we need Jesus? We've got to start with that. If you're not, if you're not practiced enough to respond, all you can do is react. I was talking to a gal that was Jewish, and she was saying how She's surrounded by, she was in a city, she's in a city with mostly, mostly evangelical Christians. And she was talking about her anger, and she was definitely emotionally angry that people say Merry Christmas to her at Christmas time. And she was physically, emotionally angry. And of course, I'm like one of those guys that really wants to say Merry Christmas at Christmas time, but I'm trying to treat her with gentleness and respect. And so I'm trying to hear her heart, and she's just really like, no one knows. Why can't they say happy holidays? Why can't they say happy Hanukkah, right? And she's just give, pouring her heart out to me, and I, I was able to not react to her, but to respond to her. That, hey, we just love that Jesus came, and we just want people to appreciate that we celebrate, not Santa Claus. We're celebrating Jesus. And so if you're prepared... If you're prepared, discipleship, why do we make disciples? Jesus said make disciples. He means spend your life preparing to tell others the good news. Can you do it? Do you work on it? Do you read God's word? Can you prepare? Because the better you're prepared, the more you'll respond, the less you will react. And then he continues to say, after being made alive, I mean, sorry, let me finish up that scripture. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's an important statement for the Christian. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. He's literally saying... Uh, I got some bad news for you. People are going to slander you sometimes. 
People are going to insult you sometimes. People are going to make fun of your faith sometimes. And sometimes, and this may suck, but it's true, you're going to suffer. Some of you work outside in some places, in some vocations, where they are very anti-Christian. And you know what it feels like to suffer. You know what it feels like to be insulted for your faith, to have people slander you. And what he's saying is if you don't get sucked into that when they slander you, guess what? They're the ones that are going to look like fools, not you. But are you going to be okay with a little bit of suffering? Because if you're not okay with that, there's going to be problems. Suffering happens. And how are you going to respond when you suffer? Will you respond in love or will you respond in anger? Have you ever been to, or, or, or read up on Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius exploded in 79 AD, erupted the volcano in Italy? It's pretty incredible because people were living peacefully at the base of this volcano, an active volcano. Beautiful city, people just going on with their lives, families being raised, businesses. And all of a sudden in 79 AD, it explodes and pours, spews hot, uh, smoldering, suffocating ash covering the entire city. And when that happened, it killed the good and the evil. It killed the mommies, it killed the babies, it killed animals, it killed the puppies, it killed the kittens, it killed everything, plants. When a volcano erupts, it doesn't care who's in its path, it kills everything. When the world responds in anger, or if you respond in anger, the damage can be devastating. That illustration, I never forgot the illustration someone said years ago to me about how when anger is like taking a nail and driving it into a piece of wood. When you say, I'm sorry, you pull the nail out, but the hole remains. The damage is done. So we have to learn to respond in love, not anger, because even if you apologize for your anger, you leave a hole. There is damage that is done. And as ambassadors of Christ, we want to be ambassadors of the love of Jesus, not anger, the love of Jesus. So it is better to suffer while loving others than to get angry and feel good about it and then feel terrible afterwards. I heard a saying once that was so true. When you're angry, you'll give the best speech you'll ever regret. (laughs) Think about that. When you're angry, sometimes you give the best speech you'll ever regret. I don't want to have great speeches that I regret for the rest of my life. 1 Peter 3.18 helps us in this process. It helps us stay strong as we develop this tough hide and tender heart. It says, starting in verse 18, But Christ also suffered once for our sins the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Which is that next life lesson that Christ suffered for us first. When tough times happen and you feel that your faith is being insulted or you're being insulted or you're being slandered, remember, it's nothing that Jesus didn't experience first. And he did it while he was dying for us, while he was giving his life for you. The righteous gave his life for the unrighteous. That's us. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Jesus made it a point to go after the lost and the suffering and the confused, the broken, the outcast, the imprisoned, the alone, the orphan, the widowed. He did whatever was necessary to bring the good news of salvation to them. And he endured the pain of, of slander. He endured the pain of insults. He endured the pain of the cross. Listen, remember he was in the garden asking for God to take this from him. He knew the pain that was coming. 
He didn't. He was hoping there was another way to do this without giving his life because of the pain of the cross. But he knew at the end of the day he was going to be obedient to God. And he wasn't going to see the fruits of what he did until after he died and then resurrected. And it just makes me wonder about us. Are we obeying God for our own glory and our own recognition? Would we be like Abraham Lincoln who didn't get to see the fruition of the abolition of slavery in our nation? I mean, he died right at the end of the war. He didn't get to see the fruits of a country coming together and a future glory of our nation as we got rid of something that was damnable. and We began to look at equal rights for everyone. He didn't get to see that. He literally, he did die at the foot of the promised land. When God asks us to love people unconditionally, are we only going to do it if we get to see the results? I had someone say to me, another pastor the other day, I was talking to him about the, the Dream Center and the money we've spent and the people that do it and the resources and the people we help and, and all the families are trying to help and what our future is and all. And I'm just going over all, and he's like, you, you know what, you are insane. What pastor does two things? You're running a church and you're trying to run a Dream Center, that's just, you're insane. And I said, yeah, well that's probably true, but but we're doing, but I'm not, we are not okay writing a check once a year and giving it to somebody and saying, here, go take care of those people. Here's our check. We took an offering. Take care of those people. Take, you take care of the broken, the orphans, the widows, the imprisoned, the lonely, the hungry. Here's my little check. You go take care of it. We're not those kinds of disciples. We're the kind of disciples who get our, roll our sleeves up, get our hands dirty. We go out there and we help those that are in need. We care for those that are in need. We love those that are in need. But we don't know what we're going to see as a result of that. There's no billboards with our pictures on it in town. These are great people. We don't get our own TV show somewhere for doing this. No fame, fortune, and glory. We're not driving for Ferraris because we took care of an orphan or a widow. Are we okay? Are we okay? Are we okay being obedient? Hmm. allowing our children or our grandchildren to reach the promised land. Are we going to be those kind of disciples? Are we those kind of people? Are we going to demand attention, recognition, results? Are we going to be okay just being obedient disciples of Jesus? That's a question we must ask ourselves. He continues on in verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authority, and power, and submission to him. You were raised up by Jesus You gave your life to him. You were baptized in the name of Jesus, forgiven of your sins so that now you may be the one who carries the good news to a broken world. You know what I find amazing? That two years ago at two in the morning, God woke me up and gave me the series for the next four years. I find it intriguing that today, a week and a half before our election, where we see the contention and the insults and the slanders all around us, that God would give this two years ago to me about protecting ourselves and being baited by insults and by slanders. It is the Spirit of God preparing the children, His children, to be ambassadors of peace. 
I'm going to ask the prayer team if they would prayer team if they come up here and join me at the front. Maybe you're here today and wow, this is all new stuff to you and you know, you know, listen pastor, I have not been following Jesus. I've not been doing it. I'm just being honest. I've been sucked up in this. I maybe I've I don't know what I've done, but I haven't been following Jesus. I want to give you a chance to do that today, right now. And if you just bow your heads for a second. If you're here today and you know Pat, you want to get right with Jesus right now, you want to make a commitment by being courageous and telling me you want to get right with Jesus, telling God you want to get right with Jesus, I'm going to ask you to be brave in this moment and let me know by raising your hand right now. Put it up. Today, I want to begin this walk with Jesus. Today, I want to get right with Jesus. Let me see it. Put it up high so I can see it. There you go. Good. Come on. Good. Excellent. Who else? This is your moment. Good. This is your moment. Come on now. This is your chance to get right with Jesus. We're going to do this together. Amen. Anyone else? Come on. Good. Good. Okay, you can put your hands down. When we finish today, those of you who rose your hand, raised your hands up, I'm going to ask you to come to the front, and we have something special for you. It's called a yes box. It helps you on this walk with Jesus. We want to pray for you. I want to personally call you and, and welcome you to our family. But for the rest of us, I also want to ask you a question. And it's the last point on this lesson. The last point says to forgive and then spread the good news. Forgive and then spread the good news. Are you willing to forgive those who make fun of you, your beliefs, your morality, who slander what you hold dear? Will you forgive them and then share the good news with them? Because you can't share the good news if you're holding bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. If that's you today, I want you to have a conversation with God and make sure as we come close to the insanity of the next week and a half that you are one who walks in a different way than the rest of the world. You walk as a light of truth and peace and forgiveness and gentleness and respect. And so would you stand with me so I can bless you and I want to bless you and dismiss you and if you need prayer for anything today. Our prayer teams believe in prayer. There's power in prayer. There's healing in prayer. There's deliverance in prayer. If you need prayer, when I dismiss, you come to the front and you receive prayer. But for the rest of you, I'm going to pray an impartation over you before we dismiss and I meet you out in the courtyard. Father, I thank you. You died for us first. You endured the suffering first. You were insulted and slandered and blasphemed first. And if we are your ambassadors, would you help us have a tough hide to withstand those insults and slanders, but a tender heart to share the good news of Jesus? Would you empower us with that gift today? We ask you to help us have a heart of forgiveness so we don't have any anger toward anyone. And then let us walk as your ambassadors from this day forward. And I ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.